well with uh, Halloween uh, well on its way here, I, I thought it, it would be appropriate to discuss uh, some of the controversial origins of this holiday. Now, now any cursory um, surf over the internet or, or even in-depth um, research will reveal and that hardly any one source agrees completely about anything beyond the basics. Uh, even the origin of trick or treat and carved pumpkins uh, is a source of fierce debate. And I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend I know all the answers. And I'm gonna just go ahead and give you multiple answers uh, for the various questions that you have. Uh, and that's, um, that's the best I can do uh, because the reality is, is that, is that scholars and folklorists and everybody's an expert on Halloween. And so I'll just kind of deep, I'll dig deep into my ancient historical knowledge and I'll give you those perspectives. So let's simply begin where most began to talk with the ancient Celts, right? So uh, Halloween. Uh, does um, has its origin in the ancient Gaelic festival uh, known as Samhain or Samhain. Uh, the very first reference uh, to Samhain uh, happened to be on a Gaulish bronze tablet that's known as the Colgny calendar. And the word uh, found here was inscribed as Samonius. Uh, and this uh, particular bronze tablet dates from the second century CE. So we have our first official mention of, um, of, uh, of, of Samhain in an, in an inscription uh, about 1,900 years ago. Obviously it goes way back further, but it's still interesting in and of itself. Uh, if we look at this, this calendar, there's a, um, a youthful uh, male uh, bronze head that's, that's nearby. And of course, you're going to see other old Irish words also inscribed on here. Now, basically, the festival of sound commemorates the end of the lighter half of the year and the beginning of the, well, darker half of the year and is sometimes viewed as the Celtic New Year. Now, the Celtic New Year is divided by a four major celebrations. You have Imlic, right? right. You have Beltane, right? Uh, you have Nasa, and you have Samhain, uh, leaving three months in between each of these sacred days. Imbolic was the festival of, of motherhood and, and, and childbirth, right? Beltane was the fertility festival of purification by fire, and it is connected to the Feast of the New King, you know, the Holy King, right? Uh, when, it, when it comes to um, uh, Lunasa, uh, this was a commemoration of, of Luke, the oak uh, god known as Bran, and the Solomonation of the New King, and, and also, of course, uh, women's mysteries were practiced uh, during this time. And finally, there's Samhain, which is the Festival of the Dead. Now, now, now we must remember Already we're getting interesting here. We must remember that the Celtic period that we call a day actually starts in the evening. That's right. The Celtic day starts in the evening at sunset and went through the night and continued through daylight to the next sunset. And that's when the next day would begin. Hence, symbolic, today, of course, te technically begins on the evening of January 31st and went on through the day of, of February 1st. The Beltane began on the evening of April 30th and went through the day of, of May 1st. And of course, um, Lunasa uh, began on the evening of July 30th and went through the day of August 1st. Drum roll, please. And that means the Samhain began on the evening of October 31st and went through the day of November 1st. This means that Samhain does not technically begin 
until sunset on October 31st. You want to be technical about it. Now, and then it actually continues all the way uh, through to November 1st. I know, it's kind of like, wait a minute, you mean all those early trick-or-treaters? <laughs> Don't ruin it for them, you know, who I'll call trick-or-treating uh, before, um, you know, before the sun sets, because, you know, for safety concerns, and I get that. Well, they're uh, they're technically not making the rounds in the Halloween. Uh, you know, it, it, it actually is the, the day before until that sun actually sets. Uh, this, by the way, the same concept does apply to the Christianized holiday, as we shall see when it is introduced at first. Interesting stuff, huh? Already, I'm just rattling everybody. Hopefully, everybody's happy. Smile, right? According, uh, accordingly, the celebrations of Imlok, Mokpain, Alunasa, Samhain were positioned at the halfway point between the equinox and the solstice. The idea is that Imbolc is midway between the midwinter solstice and the spring equinox. Beltane is midway between the spring equinox and the midsummer solstice. Lunasa is midway between the midsummer solstice and the autumn equinox. And you guessed it right. And Samhain is midway between the autumn equinox and the midwinter solstice. And of course, uh, technically, again, if these holidays were intended to be in the middle of each solar event, just let's just play technically, as things move, it's called recession. Uh, in Bali, it would actually be on February 6th, Beltane would be on May 6th, Lunasa would be on August 6th, and Samhain would be on November 6th. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. <laughs> okay, so let's keep on going. You're like, wow, <laughs> you're just playing with the calendar. Well, I'm just, being, I'm just playing with technicalities. Does it matter? No, it's not. It doesn't matter because it's all about the spirit of Halloween. Oh, yeah, there is a, a spirit about Halloween. We'll talk about that, too. Okay, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? Yeah, okay, yeah, we all got spirits here. Good. We're all in good spirits. It's better than bad spirits. Um, yeah. After this conversation, you'll probably want to have some spirits, right? <laughs> so, okay, so uh, let's keep on going, shall we? So, um, according to the Celtic belief, Samhain was the time when the good god, known as Dagda, the tribal father god by the Irish, and the Greek, uh, sorry, the great, the great queen uh, by the name of Morrigan, the goddess of war, magic, and darkness, they mate as she is over the river Unius. Okay, so that's kind of the story. Now, the name uh, Dagda derives from the Proto Celtic word uh, Daga Wilts. With, which has Indo-European roots, it literally means the good God. Right? Literally means the good God. And so there we have it. Um, also, he's known as as for Ben, the Horn Man. Uh, Dagda usually carries uh, two sacred tools, um, the cauldron and the club, and is often accompanied by a magic harp. Uh, except you know, except when he goes off the path, or you know. Now, now what happens is, according to Irish belief, Ireland was inhabited by two different groups of people. The first were known as the Pomerians. Uh, they wore their hair long. They had very uh, dark eyes, and they carried long and slender golden bronze spears. Uh, they are a supernatural race. Uh, sometimes they are, they're very, very mysterious, sometimes hostile. Uh, according, accordingly, uh, it is said they are under the world of men, according to the earliest reference to them from the 7th century CE. Uh, but they are also understood to be under the water. Some early understandings of them have them having the heads of goats. Sometimes they're depicted as having one eye, one arm, and one leg. 
But in other cases, they're understood as being quite beautiful, darkly beautiful, uh, and supposedly uh, from the age of before the flood. You know, this is, of course, Irish stories now mixing with other uh, stories besides that. Now, according, accordingly, there was a second group that's known as the Tua de Danan. Tua de Danan, uh, they were a race of golden-haired, blue-eyed people, and they they didn't fight with these spears, uh, the, the thin spears. They fought with blunt and heavy spears. Now, accordingly, uh, the uh, Tua de Danan, uh, these are pre-Christian Irish deities. Of course, later on, during the Christian age, they claim that they are the fallen angels. <laughs> um, uh, they are part of this the, the, the fairy folk later on as well. Uh, in many cases, these two different uh, uh, supernatural graces are in conflict with one another. Uh, this is all part of the Indo-European background where you have the earlier Titans that are in conflict with the Olympians, or in the Norwegian folklore, of course, the Acer and the Vinar, right? You know, or when it comes to in India, northern India, Vedic tradition, right? You have the Devas and the Asuras, right? So this is the same kind of thing that repeats itself. Remember, Indo-Europeans are all related uh, together in different ways. Okay, so anyway. So what happens is these two races come into conflict. And the story goes as follows. Uh, Dada, uh, he was the, the high priest of the golden hair people. Uh, and he had uh, a golden harp. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, it was covered in jewels. Now, uh, he would play this harp right before battle to get everybody ready to go. And so then they went on the attack, according to the story. But what happened is one day, they're going into battle. Some Fomerian uh, chieftains, uh, they actually took the harp from them. And even though uh, Dr. was close in pursuit, uh, they took his harp and they, they shut it up in the castle. Ah. That'll take away that power from him, right? And the power to inspire uh, the troops of the Tua de Danan, right? So what does he do? Well, what he does uh, is that uh, he just simply calls out to his harp. And he has, says, come to me, O harp. And immediately the harp recognizes his master's call. And it moves swiftly over uh, to him and, of course, kills all the people in between. <laughs> uh, you know, and so then he plays three chords. Uh, and first chord is the music of tears. The music of tears. And all, when they hear this, they begin to weep. Uh, women and children, as well as the great warriors. Next, he plays the music of mirth. And everybody begins to laugh. And they laugh so hard <laughs> that they, they drop their weapons. Finally, he plays the music of sleep, where all fell into a slumber. At this point, uh, Dagda left them uh, with his harp. Uh, and according to Celtic lore, um, he, they were able to defeat uh the Fomerians. so there you have the story right in fact uh now Akta's mystic club he killed nine men in one swoop so he has this great club as well and it's interesting because one end of his club is used to kill but the handle is used to do the opposite it's used to revive so one side to kill one side to revive so he has the power of life and the power of death through uh his club isn't that fascinating Right, so you're going. What does this have to do with Halloween? Everything. Oh, okay. Now already we're dealing with uh, a transition between two different worlds. In this case, it's a transition between the Fomerians and the Tua de Danan, these two mythical races 
of beans in Ireland. So this is already, uh, this, this is connected to uh, Samhain. We're going to go a little bit further here because according to Irish legend, uh, Dr. replaced uh, Nuada as the all high god of the Tua at the Nun. By the way, it's spelled a T U A T H. I listened to lots of Celtic the recordings. The T H is silent. Yeah, so it's Tua when you stop there. Tua de the Nun. Uh, this is translated as uh, people or tribe from the goddess Danu. Uh, Danu, of course. Uh, is a goddess, it's proto-Indo-European. We have lost completely the mythology that's connected to this goddess. Nothing has survived, but we do know what the root means in proto-Indo-European. Uh, it means to run and to flow in proto-Indo-European, to run or to flow. Well, very interesting because the Indo-Europeans, remember they started in the Caucasus Mountains, they swept across uh, Europe, and of course, obviously ended up uh, on the Isles of eventually Ireland. Why? Because it's the same route as the river known as Danube. <laughs> oh, okay, that was interesting. Yeah, so it's the same route. So you can see how this goddess, in a sense, moved from uh, east uh, to west. I love tracing words and ideas uh, as they move across uh, of Europe and other places. Okay. So what will happen here uh, is that he becomes the king. Now, just prior to the war, prior to the war against the Fomerians over Ireland, Dagda met with the goddess of war, and of course, other things besides that. Her name is Morrigan. Now, the Moor in Morrigan uh, can mean many different things in the Indo-European language. It can mean terror. It can mean monstrousness. Uh, and it is directly connected with the word nightmare. Hence, uh, the idea of a night terror. Okay, you see that's Morgan. In fact, in, uh, in German and Scandinavia and Polish and Croatian and Russian, the word Mara is related to the spirit that uh, gives nightmares. In fact, um, you know, in, in amongst the Germanic uh, folk, uh, uh, Mara happens to be a goblin who rides on somebody's chest as they sleep. And as she rides on their chest, it gives them nightmares, night Mara, right? Uh, you know, of course, uh, in Croatian uh, myth, uh, folklore, uh, she happens to be a beautiful woman that is much like a succubus and goes to men and takes care of them as well as gives them nightmares in the end. Uh, and of course, the old Norse legends, uh, there is a, um, uh, a Finnish sorceress by the name of Buddha, uh, and she goes, uh, she's actually hired uh, by the wife of the king, uh, Van Landi, uh, to kill him. Apparently his wife <laughs> doesn't like him too much. And so uh, she basically uh, says, says in the text that she egg rides him to death. Um, in fact, in fact, it describes Mara as treading upon him. Uh, stamping on him, stampeding upon him, much like a horse would stampede on somebody, giving him nightmares. And he, he says that he cries out for help. Uh, and his men rush to him as he's having this nightmare. Uh, and they, you know, they, they quickly hold his head because Mara seems to be attacking his head. And then she stamps on his feet. And then they grab his feet and he stamps, she stamps on his head. And yeah, he dies. Uh, and so that's the end of him. So this pretty vigorous amount of stories here, right? But she does something else, this Mara, the spirit. Uh, what she does is that, of course, she's Mara, in general, this, 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 this species of uh, nightmare givers, right? So there's not just, not just one, there's, there's like a whole species of them. They're often shown as riding horses, which is fascinating, right? Um, 
and they're usually pretty frenzied. They ride the horses at night. But the after effects is fasting. If you, if you have encountered one of these Mara, one of these female nightmare givers, your hair is left curly. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happens is, is they, they tangle your hair <laughs> uh, uh, for every victim. Um, I don't know how they're going to do with me, but, uh, you know, uh, for those who have hair, uh, they tangle it up. Uh, in fact, apparently, when they come across trees, uh, the spirits of the trees, they give the spirits of the trees nightmares as well. And that's why, according to belief, um, trees that have been given nightmares have twisted branches. <laughs> All right. We're still talking about Halloween. We still are. We're talking about the early origins. You just haven't heard any of these stories, have you? Because, all right, here we go. Uh, so we have Mora, or Mara, which is, of course, the nightmare part. Vignan means queen. So Mora, again, means queen of the mares, or queen of these nightmare, or these, these, these creatures, right? Or it can be translated as nightmare queen, right? Some sites like you have them being the very habits, right? So, according to the Battle of Mog Perit, uh, next, when Dagda arrives to meet Morrigan, Morrigan is washing herself with one foot firmly planted on each side of the Unius River. So she's on two different sides of the river. The day of their meeting was a lucky one because they met, that's right, all these stories are kind of rolling together on Samhain. That's right. They met on Samhain and they had their special relationship, relations right there and then as she was on with one foot on the river, on one side of the river and one foot on the other, they are making out. Um, Yes, and so Morgan agrees to convince the Irish magicians to side on the side uh, that Tua did not against the Fomerians after this deed is done and destroying their king, Edech, by stealing the blood of his heart and the kidneys of his valor. This is the early story of, 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 of Samhain. <laughs> it's you know, origins in Ireland, right? And the idea of transitions. You know, this is like two different uh, races, supernatural races. And then you have, of course, two sides of the river and, and these two gods coming together, right? This is all connection of this idea of liminal spaces in between. These are transitions, are they not? So let's go a little bit further. So in some versions of this uh, Irish myth, Dagda also made it with Bowen Boy which is the goddess of the river Boing. Now, while Boing was always the wife of Nikton, the god of the water, she was said to have an illicit affair with Dagda uh, and resulted in the birth of Ingus, who is the god of love. Now, with this, another, this is Samhain story number two. I mean, the Angus, Angus story is another Samhain story? Yeah. You're here to hear the early stories? You're going to hear them. Okay, Angus. Obviously, um, what happens here is that, um, um, well, they, they, of course, they keep this affair kind of quiet. They magically uh, keep it covered. Now, what happens now is uh, the son of goddess Boing, of course, his name is Angus, as I mentioned. Remember, this is the result of the affair that uh, Yagda uh, had with the river Boing the goddess of the river boy. So what happens is this, is that uh, um, Angus, uh, he's connected, as I said, to the powers of romantic and sexual love, uh, but um, he falls in love with Care Abramite, which by the way, just means you berry. And you know, the you berry just happens to be connected with death. Thereby, she becomes literally a fruit or offspring of death. 
Now, I think this is interesting because here you have Angus, who is who is connected to love, to life, and he falls in love with what? Death. <laughs> Okay, and of course, obviously, her father, uh, Etho Annabel, it was the king of a place known as Si or Sai, which is known as a mound uh, where the spirits of the dead frequent. In fact, they will call, in many cases, burial mounds by this name. So there's, there is definitely a connection with death. Here. So how does he meet her? I mean, does he just meet her and see her? No, no. He, he, he meets her in his dreams as he sleeps at night. Angus sees this beautiful young girl, and he falls deeply in love with her. And in fact, she visits him night after night. Angus becomes obsessed. He has fallen in love with her, fallen in love with this, this death, right? And so, um, so what happens is that his mother and his father, uh, Dagda, they look for this, this woman uh, somewhere in the Irish countryside. They don't well, find her. Finally, uh, a certain king, Bodhair of Munster, uh, the region of Ireland, uh, found her. So when Angus seeks to, to uh, you know, meet with her, Unfortunately, the father says, no, 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 I don't want this connection to happen. I don't want you, <laughs> you know, this, this God of romantic love and life getting together with my daughter, of course, who is a representation of death. No, no. Are you seeing the transitional aspect already? Yeah, okay, here we go. Sound what's happening. Here it goes. So what happens now is that she... He, uh, he actually chains his daughter to a wall with 150 other women who have the gift of transformation. So she's chained to a wall with 150 other women because she's a shapeshifter. You see, uh, she has a shapeshifting ability. It happens only on, guess what day it happens? Yeah, it only happens on the day of Samhain. On the day of Samhain, she changes shape. It happens. So one Samhain, she turns into a swan, and she will remain a swan for the rest of the year and into the next year until the next Samhain. And then at that point, she will turn into a human, and then she'll be a human for that year all the way up through the next Samhain, and then she'll turn into a swan again. You guys got it? Well, unfortunately, uh, she was right in the middle of the swan phase. <laughs> it's kind of his swan song. <laughs> and the reason why uh, she's chained up with 150 other women is because all of them have this gift of transforming, not, or a curse, of transforming into a swan as well. So the idea is, is that uh, when Angus arrives to meet with her, as she happens to be in her swan form this year, well, he has to choose between 150 swans. So she is one out of 149 swans. Uh, and of course, that's pretty upsetting. So what happens is he's told that he had to pick her out from the group. Um, you know, and but you know what he does? He he chooses correctly. He chooses the right swan. And he turns himself into a swan and he meets with her and the two fly off and they go around the Loch El Bregan. They go around this lake three times. And when they do that, they make everybody go to sleep. And then of course, uh, they make love in Angus's palace. And of course, this, this idea uh, transfers over again to Samhain the idea of the Samhain transformation is not to be lost. This is a threshold time between, yes, love, but it's also a time of death. 
I suppose that many have never heard that story. So you've seen some of the background of Samhain now. Now there's another story. I love these stories, right? Uh, the further Samhain story involves the destruction of the, it's not very happy, a magical hill known as Terra, right? Uh, this is the home of the gods and high kings of Ireland, uh, but it's been destroyed constantly. In fact, uh, it is it is being destroyed over and over again uh, by this goblin by the name of Alien. And he does this over and over again. Um, in fact, um, quite a few times, and to the point where they need to do something about this. And so uh, what happens is that the harp, he plays the harp, and he plays it beautifully. He lulls everybody to sleep, and then he burns Terra to the ground. Um, and um, he has, of course, this power of fire. Uh, he does this for 23 years in a row. So so this hero by the name of Finn, Mac Gumeo, uh, who with his bag of magic weapons, uh, he decides to defeat the goblin. And so what he does is when Alien, uh, he casts the spell to put everybody to sleep. What happens is that uh, Finn, what he does is he puts a spear to his head so that he's in constant pain. <laughs> so, so that when the spell is cast, this pain in his head wakes him up. And then what he does, of course, is he, he kills the goblin with the, the, the same spear. And that's the end of that. That runs again. There's a Samhain theme, right? Every single Samhain, Terra is destroyed and this, through destruction. But uh, the remedy happens. Uh, good news. Uh, Finn saves the day in the end. Now, it's interesting because the hill of Terra itself, uh, is, um, is still there in Ireland. Uh, this mound is aligned with the midpoint between the spring equinox and the autumn equinox. Uh, of course, pinpointing the inlet, which is, of course, um, you know, and then, of course, another part is um, connected, uh, points towards the in between, between the summer and winter solstice, right, the summer. Uh, and so this is, of course, a sour, right? So uh, so it's interesting because the directions are there in there. And um, it's interesting also because um, today, uh, it was moved here in 1798. So you happen to have the Stone of Destiny there, which is pretty cool. It's the Speaking Stone. It wasn't originally there. It was moved uh, from another site. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it was moved there in 1798, as I said, to commemorate uh, a battle where 400 rebels were um, were, were buried. Uh, but what happens is, is that this is the so-called speaking stone. Anyway, the Celts, which of course includes everybody from northern France, Ireland, and England, and Scotland, and Wales, and Brittany, believe that during Samhain, the border between this world uh, and the other world became very thin, permitting spirits, both harmless and harmful, to pass through. In fact, many of them believe that the mystical doors of the burial mounds were opened, freeing the spirits of ancestors and family and old friends and even enemies upon the realm of the living. Now, while magic kept them away through various means throughout the year, well, during the time of Samhain, this was a period where the spirits were offered a free pass of entry into this world. And, you know, they were, they just flowed across, right? Um, no, uh, no uh, uh, magical passwords were needed to enter or leave these worlds because they were virtually overlapping upon one another. In fact, better said, the two worlds just happening right now, slowly, gradually, are collapsing against one another overlapping and so these worlds are coming as one and the spirits now just simply to the other side of course to the celts the mundane and the supernatural were always closely connected but uh, but but Samhain was still this special time now a variety of spirits and creatures 
were said to move about during Halloween. One folk story told of an old witch named Alison Gross, who placed one of her spells upon a certain young man. This is an early one. Oh, Alison Gross, that lives in Yon Tower, the ugliest witch in the North Country. She turned me into an ugly worm and garbed me, toddle around a tree. But as it fell out last hollow event, when the Searly Fairly Court was riding by, the queen lighted down on a gallery bank not far from the tree where I want to lie. She changed me again to my own proper shape, and I no more toddle about the tree. Now, let me tell this story. Well, once again, uh, this is this this is uh, an echo of earlier stories before, and that um, and I'll go there. Most people again, this is something we're not oftentimes talked about. This is a transformative period of time, but this time could also mean your own transformation. Did you notice earlier on uh, you have this shape shifting theme going on? Yeah, right. It's at the heart of the early Halloween, the Samhain legends. And um, I think we've kind of lost this as time went on. This is a, a later echo of that idea. Okay. So uh, to ward the evil away, not only did they have the symbol protection uh, placed before their homes in various locations, which we'll talk about, don't worry, but they often disguised themselves uh, as in rather scary ways. Uh, later on, these will be scary masks and outfits, you know, so that the spirit may think that they were, you know, likewise spirits and, and leave them alone. As we dig earlier on, um, it turns out that most of these disguises, uh, people are wearing animal heads and animal skins. So maybe not quite looking like fellow spirits, maybe just not looking like um, the humans. <laughs> nothing but animals here, even so low, nothing but animals, which I find that is that's a little other interesting twist. But yes, it is true later on, uh, we'll have the various disguises. Eventually, uh, the villagers, uh, they'll form processions and they will wear costumes. And the idea is they will lead the people, I should say, lead the spirits out of the village. So they'll wear these outfits and they'll have a procession and hopefully as they leave the village, the spirits will follow. But that's sort of the story, right? In, in Scotland, um, ghosts were impersonated by, by young men uh, and they oftentimes wore white, they wore masks and sometimes they simply just covered up their faces and they would leave food out uh, for their ancestors, as well as for uh, various travelers to appease the spirits. Now, the first listing uh, of wearing masks, uh, the earliest reference in Scotland is from 1585. That's, that's, but it still echoes earlier stories and legends. However, in Ireland, this looks like much of Salwood is coming from Ireland, right? In Ireland, you have the, the hobby horse that goes way back. And I dug through a whole bunch of <laughs> pretty interesting materials. And I found some folklorists from the 19th century uh, and, uh, and them going in and talking about local customs and going back further in Ireland. And I found this pretty, pretty interesting. In Southern Ireland, and this goes even further back, uh, they have what's called the hobby horse. This is somebody, there's two people that dress up. One's the horse front, one's the horse end. This is Laban. This is the white mare uh, who happens to be, the person who's at the head happens to be the head of the ceremonies, according to the source. And led the young uh, along this procession and they would go around and they would recite verses dedicated to the gods and the goddesses and they would go from farm to farm but especially they wanted to appeal uh, to a Celtic god 
by the name of Muk Allah. Muk Allah, so it's a Muk Allah. Uh, and what happens is uh, as you go from farm to farm, you're supposed to, when you see this procession, you're supposed to give them food. So farmers would see this procession headed by this hobby horse and they would give them milk or they give them butter or eggs or wheat. And sometimes they'll give them wool. But if the farmer was selfish, did not give this procession moving along anything, then there was a tragedy of what something would happen to the farmer. So auspicious, very important that you do so. And you can see once again how these stories and legends will then cross over to Scotland and then move down to England into this idea of these processions leaving villages and the idea of the spirits uh, leaving with them. But it's a gradual uh, change, a gradual evolution. Now, um, now not all the spirits are, are viewed as troublesome. Uh, I mean, they were, in many cases, spirits of dead friends and family. And so, uh, and they were to be, you know, comforted by the Samhain bonfires. Uh, here, the living would uh, symbolically feast with the friendly dead. Uh, this occasion was called the Feast of the White-Haired One, or of the Snow Goddess, or sometimes simply called uh, the Feast of the Dead. Now, of course, if you take a look at this word, uh, Morgan Finn, or Morgfin uh, in English, but Morgfin in the Irish. Uh, this simply means, of course, goddess uh, of the fair hair or the white hair. Uh, and this goddess apparently arrived from Munster, a region of Ireland. Uh, we do know a little bit about this goddess. Uh, she, she was the wife of the, the high king uh, by the name of Echort. Uh, and she was the first wife, and she gave him three sons. Uh, then he took on a second wife, and uh, she didn't like uh, his son too well, Karen. And there's lots of stories. Uh, sorry, uh, so that the wife's name is Karen. His name was Nile of the Nine Hostages. And what happens is there's all these disputes and fights, as you know, she's the, you know, he's the son of the second wife, and she's pretty upset by it. But uh, when it comes time for the change of power of High King, uh, this is another story woven in, because this is the reason why it's called this, so you want to listen up, right? So her brother, Crimthong, is supposed to be the next High King after Echort, right, after her husband. But she doesn't want her brother to be King, the High King. No, no, no. She wants her son to be the next king, next high king of Ireland. So what she does is she mixes a poison and she's going to give this drink to her uh, brother. <laughs> the brother goes, hey, I do I know this is not poison? And she goes, I'll show you. And she drinks the poisoned uh, potion. And she acts like she's okay. He's like, oh, okay, I'll try it then. And he drinks and he dies. But she dies too. And you know what that was? Drum roll, please. The day this happened was Samhain. <gasps> oh, now you got it. Now I'm going, oh, that's why it's called the Feast of the White Haired One, dedicated to Mong Fin. If you want spelling, I'll give it M O I N G F H I N N E. And then the English uh, is M-O-N-G-F-I-N-D. Interesting, huh? So there you have it. Did, so once again, you're saying, wow, this is another, another Samhain story that we didn't expect to hear. Oh, I know. Now, Samhain is a time of the gathering of the rest of the crops. Everything else uh, that was left and harvested after Samhain was to be abandoned and was considered unlucky. That it was a taboo. And so it was enforced by these mystical spirits known as the puka. Sometimes viewed as a goblin, sometimes uh, viewed as a fairy. Uh, so it, it kind of goes, goes back and forth between the two, right? Um, now they thrived at night and they found delight tormenting humans. 
Um, they were, like I said, more prone to uh, causing problems. Yet at the same time, uh, they were known to give good advice. And sometimes they could keep people out of harm's way. Still, the puka made sure that the crops were contaminated after sowing. So this is the idea when crops go bad, you know, uh, the puka are the ones that make it go bad, that make it, you know, make it un un unhealthy to have, right? Of course, uh, in Irish beliefs, the puka demand their own share of the harvests. Uh, so it's left over for them. Okay, now, they were known to be shapeshifters as well. Once again, we're back to the shapeshifting theme. Uh, sometimes they were a goat or a rabbit or, or a bull or a dog. Sometimes they were a black horse and, of course, a goblin. Uh, but you can always recognize the puka because it, no matter what they turn into, they always had orange eyes. And their hair or fur was always dark. That's how you can recognize a puka. They were also, they could also transform into an eagle. Of course, it will be a black eagle. And they had this huge wingspan. They swoop down. <laughs> they like to swoop down on unsuspecting travelers who are just walking along, pick them up, <clears throat> grab them, and then carry them over off and throw them into the mud. <laughs> oh, and of course, you could never insult a puka, although some people who are thrown in the mud were tempted to do so, because if they did so, this would be bad luck, right? I, I had to tell you a puka story. So um, one tale tells of, of the puka uh, that was uh, recorded by Lady Wild, uh, 1821 to 1896. We're talking about how one day a farmer's son by the name of Fadrick uh, was able to actually see a puka. They're typically invisible to the eyes. But the first thing he did after crying out, oh, it's a puka, is that he offered him a coat to wear. The first thing he did was kindness. The puka was touched. And so transformed himself into a young bull and told him to come to the old mill that night to see what he was doing there. So the first night he didn't fall asleep. But the next, when he woke up in the morning, uh, he saw that, hey, there was uh, a whole grain of flour that was ground up for him. The next night, he did the same as Puka. The Puka then brought in a whole bunch of the other Puka, and they are making, they're constantly grinding grain uh, for him. Uh, he became wealthy. <laughs> he had all the grain he needed to distribute to other people. And then finally, one day, he gave the original puka an outfit of silk, and he was filled with gratitude, and the puka left being thankful with all the other puka to travel the world, uh, but he was thankful, uh, and, and the, the guy was rich, rich anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, when uh, he got married, the puka actually left him a golden cup filled with drink uh, to guarantee a happy marriage. So puka are not all bad. Right, They're, they can be very good too. A puka were also known to offer prophecies for the coming year during this celebration. What? Yes, yes. So we know that during Samhain, the puka uh, were able to offer prophecies. So another important connection uh, to this this holiday. Uh, for example, at Leinster, a plump uh, sleep terrible steed annually came to the villagers on Samhain uh, and provided an oracle, offering up intelligent and proper answers to those who consulted it concerning all that would befall them until November the next year. Uh, and of course, they would offer up gifts uh, to this, this puka in disguise, of course, disguise, to thank them, him or her, it, uh, for its gift. It's interesting, right? So, uh, yes, yeah, so the puka are very much part of the ancient Samhain stories. The Irish puka um, are known as bucks. Um, and then, of course, you have Cornish ones as well. Uh, it's interesting that uh, um, even fishermen uh, gave offerings to the puka. Um, they leave it on the sand at night, a portion of their, their catch. Now, 
Samhain was not only a transitional time when it came to the growing seasons, um, but also when it came to uh, tending livestock. So what happens here, uh, as winter approached, early pastoralists could not feed the entire uh, herd because of the limited amount of food available during the tough winter old months. So what they had to do is they had to kill off part of the herd and keep the best for breeding purposes. The, now the part of the herd that was killed and salted for winter storage um, uh, was slaughtered, of course, obviously on the occasion of Samhain. That's right. So Samhain is a time where you where they'd slaughter the excess animals and prepare them, uh, salt them uh, for the winter. At this period of time, also, uh, bonfires were part of the festivities. Uh, in fact, um, now the fire was ignited from branches that were collected from some magical grove or location. Uh, what will happen is many believe that this bonfire served uh, as a representation of the sun. So the bonfire represents the sun. And so keeping the fires burning bright, uh, the idea is that through the sympathetic magic, the sun itself would burn brighter and longer into the winter months, continue its power of growth and holding back longer the season of death and decay. So the idea is you want to build a big bonfire. You want this thing to blaze because the more it blazes, the more through sympathetic magic, it energizes the sun and gives it its energy so that it will be stronger throughout the winter months right? and more life-giving. Right? Obviously, uh, this bonfire served another purpose, and that is uh, it served to dispose of the bones of the slaughtered livestock. So they burned these uh, the bones there to, to uh, take care of it. Now, um, sometimes, some say, you know, all the time, depends. Uh, there's view, different views on this. Two bonfires would be built side by side. And there was an elaborate ceremony orchestrated about the twin fires with people and their livestock walking between, <clears throat> walking between them in a purification ritual. Okay. So both the smoke and the ash from these fires were believed <clears throat> to have uh, magical cleansing properties. Those who went before the flames were also to take a sprig of fur, <clears throat> place it into the bonfire, and bring <clears throat> the consecrated flames back to their homes with their hearths relit. In this way, this fire magic could benefit every individual family. So <clears throat> that means when they're lighting these bonfires or bonfire, their fire in their own hearth, in their own home, was put out. The year is over. It's time to put out that flame. The idea is they put out all the hearths, uh, which are kindling uh, you know, the central communal bonfire. And the, idea, the idea is what you're supposed to do is you pick a spring from this life-giving new fire, and you go back uh, to your hearths and you relight the fire to represent a new beginning, a new birth, um, and so for the year to come. So that's kind of the ritual. Another common practice was, uh, oh, I want to mention one more fun things. You know, these bonfires, as we know, science, right? Lots of bugs are attracted to these bonfires. And you know what the bugs attracted? Bats. So lots of bats would then swerve and try to eat the bugs. Uh, so bats start to be connected to the season of Samhain and this era, uh, this, this concept in general. Okay, another common practice was divination uh, that also involved uh, in a communion-like feast with both food and drink. Now, one rather uh, ominous form of divination involved 
placing stones around the Samhain bonfire. Each of these stones were said or were supposed to represent a person in the village. So, so these stones, each one representing, you know, somebody. Uh, some have imagined that these stones were even painted or dressed to look like various individuals in the village, which that would be kind of creepy. But anyway, so what happens is this. They would leave these stones around the fire. Uh, then the villagers would hold their torches and run around the bonfire, actually this way, run around the bonfire, building up the magical energies, hoping for the best. The next morning, they look at the stones. If any of these stones were disturbed, they would read them in a way to suit an oracle. So the movement of these stones would mean something. And if the stone was knocked over, it would mean a disaster for that person or death. Now, uh, there's many anthropologists, of course, Fraser is one of them, uh, said, believe that earlier times, uh, if anybody's stone was completely knocked over, that person was sacrificed to the gods or, or the goddess. But um, there was human sacrifice, we know, because hello, archaeology, we know way, early on, you know, that, that occurred amongst the Celts, just like everybody else. So, but this is a possibility, maybe. Uh, now, moving on, are we, do we feel like we understand Samhain? We'll go back to some of the Samhain rituals. We're not completely done, but let's talk about the next overlay. The next overlay, because, because what happens is that Halloween is a combination of these different traditions. Let's move, uh, let's go on to the Romans. Now, when the Romans, they conquered Northwestern Europe, they proceeded to assimilate aspects of this Celtic holiday with their own festival. That festival was dedicated to Pomona. Of course, you're here to work Pomona, you think of the city that was named after the goddess Pomona. This is the goddess of fruits and trees. Uh, one, of course, the, of the prominent symbols of the goddess Pomona was the symbol of the apple. And, of course, the tradition for bobbing for apples on Halloween arise via Roman games played during this period. Now, the name of the goddess Pomona uh, derives from the Latin word pomon, which means fruit, and apparently was simply a wood nymph at first connected to the orchards and loved the frequent fruit trees, with apples being her very favorite one. Uh, she is sometimes shown holding a cornucopia of fruit uh, with her ability to give much abundance. She's very beautiful. And many seek after her, but of course she refuses them all, including her fellow Woody-like uh, gods uh, like Sylvanas and Picus. So Vertumnus, uh, who happens to be god of the seasons <clears throat> related to plant growth, uh, he in gardens and orchards, he falls in love with her, you know. But he knows that she's not going to listen to his proposal, so he turns himself transforms himself into an old woman and goes up uh, to her, up to Pomona, and says, hey, you know that uh, Vertumnus guy, he's, he's pretty great. Marry him. So she's tricked. <clears throat> he's pretty. And so they get married. And together, uh, of course, they bring fruit on measure. Now, now, the festival dedicated to Pomona was celebrated on August 13th uh, every year. So August 13th, every year. But when the Romans arrived in Britain in 43 CE, occupying much of that isle all the way up to the year 410 CE, they merged this festival with the Celtic Samhain. They come together. Got it? Celebrate at the same time. Okay, well, sort of. <laughs> you see, the Roman uh, 
writer by the name of Pliny the Elder states that the Celtic New Year begun in July as opposed to October, November. But, uh, you know, he could have made a mistake, you know, maybe, right? So now, but the idea is, is that when the apple was, was seen uh, in, in the Celtic regions, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> the idea of the, um, you know, you cut open an apple, what do you see? When you cut open an apple, uh, you see, um, you see five seeds that appears like a pentagram. All right. Now, of course, pentagrams go way back. I mean, they go back to Ur around 3,500 BCE. The Greeks, obviously, Pythagoras, right? You know, and um, this is like a meeting of mutual well being and, and uh, so forth. Uh, it, you know, did you know that the, the pentagram was even used for the symbol of Jerusalem? Uh, during the uh, Hellenistic Judaism period. Yeah, yeah, all the way up to around 150 BCE, 300 BCE. So, pentagrams are common. Uh, and of course, obviously, this is the point of com uh, controversy of, of pentagrams this early amongst the Celts. However, don't worry, uh, you still have the fiveness idea. The fiveness is a big deal amongst the Celts, and it goes all the way back. So, they, they see the five, the five seeds within the apple, that will absolutely mean something in a magical sense. Uh, you know, you're going to have uh, the fiveness. Of course, there's a story uh, from Kermach's Cup of Gold. This is an Irish story of uh, this royal fortress. And there's this well in the middle that has five salmon in it. Uh, and, uh, and there are five streams that flow from this great well. And this is the well of what? The well of knowledge. And it's said to, to to burble the sweetest music. So you got you got the fives there. And, you know, obviously Sir Gallon and the <laughs> and the Green Knight, of course, Ireland has what you know. Uh, it has five major roads, five provinces, five paths of the law. I mean, you see five is everywhere. So yes, they'll see the apples, and it's kind of hard. So they will see a magical, special meaning to this that will be understood as also pentagrams as well. So, and this is connected to obviously fertility uh, and used for. Uh, so, what will happen is is that uh, uh, during this period of time, uh, game of bobby for apples then became a fertility ritual, uh, played between boys and girls to determine uh, who would marry uh, who and when. The first person to bite into the apple was next to be married, according to this folkloric story. Uh, if the girl and boy bited the same apple or two different apples at the same time, it was a perfect match. Got it? Yeah. So, so there you have it. Right now, uh, what will happen is is that um, uh, in 1902, uh, the British author by the name of Davenport Adams records many Celtic fairy lore stories, talking about divination. And I want to read this one. Uh, he says the apples are thrown into a tub of water. And you endeavor to catch one in your mouth as they bob around and around in a provoking fashion. When you have caught one, you peel it carefully and pass a long strip of peel thrice sunwise around your head, after which you throw it over your shoulder and it falls to the ground in the shape of the initial letter of your true love's name. <laughs> You're what? I want to hear that again. But when you have caught one, you peel it carefully. So you peel the apple and you pass the long strip of the peel thrice sunwise around your head. And then you throw it over your shoulder. And supposedly, uh, you know, you see how these long little peel, whatever shape that letter appears in, uh, that's the first initial of your first love's name. So it had a certain appeal. Okay, stopping. Also related to the bobbing of apples, you have a custom known as the snap apple, uh, where an apple was hung from a string. Uh, obviously, we talked about this. Still another ritual was to place nutshells into a fire after pronouncing the love interest name. If the nutshells burn steadily and a long-lasting long, long lasting love was predicted, but if it snapped away in the hearth, this love was only a passing fancy. So 
uh, basically is that, um, yeah, uh, so if uh, you throw it to the fire and it just keeps burning, it's like, wow, that's, that's true love. But if it goes snap, crackle, pop, guess what? It's a passing fancy, nothing to see here, right? They call it snap apple night when they celebrate. Another Roman custom, this is important to the to get Mona now combining with salad. Another Roman custom was that uh, eventually that eventually would assimilate the salad was the days the Romans set aside for the dead, which eventually evolved into the Christian era uh, to be confined to Samhain uh, and then turned to Halloween. For the Romans, certain days were designated to honor the graves of the deceased. Initially, that which was called the Nine Days of Sorrow was observed after the person's death. If the body was cremated, the flames were doused with water or wine, and then the ashes needed to have time to dry up. So during this time, um, uh, these ashes were collected and placed into an urn. On the last day of this observance, a sacrifice uh, to the deceased was made, and anything promised in the will became official, whether it was inherited or inheritance and so forth or personal items. Well, after nine days, the ritual mourning concluded. If the person happened to be the spouse of the deceased, of course, uh, they had to keep mourning for the next 10 months. Another day that will be combined is, is the departed birthday. Uh, this is called the base Nautilus. And once again, uh, what will happen is, is that you arrive on the day of their birthday and you light you lit actually light by their tombs. And then what you do is you ha would have a feast for them, which is known as a refrigerium. So you would eat at the graveside with these with these lights around the tomb. And typically you would eat their favorite foods. Does this sound like another day that would come later on? Yeah, the Romans are celebrating the day that's very similar to the Day of the Dead that we see arising from, uh, from Mexico and other places. Does that make sense? But the Latins have this too, right? You see how things are going to start to combine along. Now, they also had a feast for parents and kinfolk that was celebrated on February 13th to the 21st. It's called the Parentalia. And once again, uh, this is a, a refrigerium. You would have a feast by the tombs. Uh, you also had another day of the Ferelia and the Rosalia, where you put flowers, roses uh, by those you love. But of course, not all the dead were properly buried. And so they ended up as ghosts. So on May 9th, on May 11th, and May 13th, you have the Lemuria, with the unsettled and sometimes malevolent dead. Uh, would prowl around your house. So what do you do? Well, they would appear around midnight. At this time, the household gathered around and everyone would take off their shoes and they walked barefoot upon the ground. Next, the worshiper, um, who is the head of the household, usually the Padre Familius, was to make the sign of his thumb in the middle of his forehead with washed hands from a clean spring water. And then he was to take black beans and throw them with an averted face, saying nine times, Hec ego meto, his redemo me que mis que fabis. <laughs> Which means, these I cast with thee, I redeem me and mine. Uh, and of course, obviously, uh, is believed that the, the spirits would be running outside of the house, chasing after these beans. <laughs> and then he touched the water and mixed the entire household, a clash bronze pots and declared, the ghost of my fathers and ancestors, be gone, be gone. And so this was a festival of keeping uh, those night prowlers and those unwanted dead away from the household. As I said, so you're going, we'll see how this combines with Halloween in a few moments. 
So but what, let's, 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 before we go there, though, let's talk about the name Halloween. Well, the Eden part uh, is uh, basically uh, abbreviated for even, which means evening, right? And hollow means holy. And so the complete word is holy evening or all hollows eve. Now, of course, this later on becomes representative of a Christian holiday held on November 1st that will overlay the Celtic celebration and the Roman celebration. And of course, uh, it will be understood within a new matrix of ideas, but still using the ancient symbolism. So you're going to have now the Pomona festivities <laughs> combining with the Celtic Samhain with this Christian overlay. Don't worry, I'll give you exact details of when this happens. And I'll tell you who did it. So you'll know exactly. So hold on. So for instance, uh, the day uh, remains in honor of the dead but within a Christian context. So this has turned into a day to honor the saints. On this day, Christians believe that the saints and redeemed sinners were restored to heaven. This was also an important evening of reconciliation, whereby uh, souls who were worthy of achieving sainthood, but kind of forgotten because of human rather than divine fallacy, were honored and named as saints. Uh, adjoining the festival of All Hallows was also All Saints Day. This was another Christian festival celebrated on November 2nd, dedicated to all the dead, whether they were redeemed or not. And this became known as All Souls Day. Okay. So All Souls Day or All Saints Day. So what will happen here is, so when did this, here we go, when did this overlay take place? Well, and when did, when did it happen? You guys ready? So the guy who did all this, his name is Pope Gregory the First. Now, he decided to change the Christian missionary policy from tearing down pagan sites to reforging them for Christian worship in the year 601 CE. So if a sacred tree, for example, was an important focal point, now then, uh, follow the policy of, of, of knocking it down, chopping it down, like St. Martin of Tours did, right? Or St. Boniface in Germany, who's cutting down on the sacred oaks. No, the idea is what we're going to do is not take away their focal point. We're simply going to reconsecrate this tree uh, to Christ or to a saint. And this is an actual decision that was made in 601. So you can see how the earlier tradition will then slip in. Hence, Samhain, which was dedicated to the dead, became more and more dedicated to specifically the Christian dead, and of course, by default, the saints. Good, okay. So you have this gradual change. Samhain is changing. Next, next thing, the Roman day of Lemuria. It's a problem. You know, it's this dark holiday, the Romans. So what happens is Pope Boniface, um, what he does on May 13th, 609 or 610, is that he replaces, he changes Lemuria from this dedication to these, you know, these creatures and these dark spirits and the forgotten dead. He reconsecrates it dedicated to the Blessed Virgin and all the martyrs. So he does so again on May 13th, 609. On this date, this Pope also rededicated the Blessed Virgin and all the martyrs uh, in, a Christian, in a Christianization of many of the pantheon of these, of these Roman bots. This is where Roman gods and goddesses and other gods start becoming saints. <laughs> <laughs> Even this day became known as All Saints Day. I know we got a whole bunch of All Saints Day. Don't worry, we'll clear it up in a little bit. But this day 
that was Lemuria, that now became celebrated uh, as the day of the Blessed Virgin and the Martyrs, was celebrated on May 13th, not November 1st. Uh, yet. Meanwhile, still, on November 1st, you still have another Christianized Samhain that's gradually going through these stages, but still the old Samhain is going on at the same time. So when does this all merge together? I'll give you the date. What? Another date. Pope Gregory now, the fourth, in 834, tried to supplant the Roman holiday in connection to the Lemuria that refused to go away with this version of the Christian holiday of All Saints Day by, he's the one, who now moves the date from May 13th to November 1st. So, the, so what happens, the exact year is 834. Now, this time, <laughs> this Lemuria uh, that's also dedicated to the saints. Meanwhile, you have over here, you have Samhain that is still kind of being dedicated to the saints. So you have these, you have these two saint holidays <laughs> kind, of, kind of bouncing around. He basically says, okay, let's, get, let's move Lemuria because people are still too connected to that date and dedication to uh, evil and the spirits and the unwanted dead. We just got to move the whole date. And he then combines it together. And now Lemuria, which was Lemuria, uh, which is now the saint dedicated, uh, sorry, dedicated to the Mary and the saints, is now as one with Samhain. So the actual day is 834. You guys got it? Wow. If you wanted details, now you know. As for, well, wait a minute. What about All Souls Day? Can you tell me when All Souls Day comes about? Yes, I will. So we have All Saints Day. So what will happen is All Souls Day, it comes about, the story goes, is there's a Saint Odilo. He was an abbot of the powerful Cluny Monastery. Uh, this is during the 9th century or the 800s. So it's the same time as Pope Gregory. The story happens that he makes a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And then he's shipwrecked in this, on this inhospitable island. And while exploring this island, well, guess what happens? He runs into, falls into a chasm leading to purgatory. And he heard the desperate screams of those lacking redemption and those who are being brutally tortured. The memory haunted this pilgrim even after he was rescued. So what happened is, is that uh, he begged uh, uh, at uh, Abbot Odillo, he begged that, they, that there be some kind of intercession for the tortured souls in purgatory. The abbot agreed to do so, and uh, in fact said, you know what we need to do? This abbot from Clooney says, after hearing this pilgrim story, he says, you know what we need to do? We need to uh, have um, a day dedicated to it. And this, of course, uh, happens on November 2nd. Now, what will happen is the commoners, many already celebrating various days in memory of the deceased, simply concentrated their activities on this day. And so, for instance, the Roman custom of dinners for the dead, whereby the family would go out and commemorate the deceased by sitting by their graves and having a picnic, in some cases baking special cakes and pouring wine upon the site as a libation in order to feed the souls of their loved ones was easily transferred to this date. So now all those other rituals I talked about that the Romans did for the dead that were spread out throughout the Roman calendar, they all get focused now also on November 1st and November 2nd. And so there you have, even though these ideas were initially discouraged, they kept it going on. Sometimes observers would venture beyond the cemetery, going house to house and even village to village with a special um, hollowed-out turnip lantern, the light within symbolizing the souls that were trapped in purgatory. Once again, this purgatory idea now permeates the, 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 the concept of Halloween. Uh, this custom was talked about uh, in the 1500s, but dates way earlier. They would also beg for, as they go around from place to place, these, uh, these processions, uh, holding this uh, this lantern, they had also begged for soul cakes. 
which is basically made out of square pieces of bread with currants. In Wales, the sole cake was called a bowl cake. Uh, it was called a dirge cake around a Yorkshire. The idea is the more soul cakes they got, the more prayers would be given on behalf of the dead relatives of those who gave them the soul cake. So the idea is, hey, if I give you a soul cake, you're going to pray for my dead relative in purgatory with your prayers to help them get out and go to heaven. Because, you know, if you don't, maybe they're going to slip into the chasm down below. And so this is the idea. And, you know, and, hey, if you give them a lot more, have a lot of soul cakes, they're going to give you a lot of prayers in return. What a deal, right? What a deal. And if you give it to a beggar, wow. I mean, this is, you're going to get even more prayers because they have nothing to lose, right? They even sang an All Souls Carol. It's not a Christmas carol, but it's a Soul Souls Carol. And I'm going to sing, we're not going to sing, I'm going to say this carol to you. It goes as follows. Soul, soul, for a soul cake. I pray you, good missus, a soul cake, an apple, a pear, a plum, or a cherry, or any good thing to make us merry. One for Peter, two for Paul, three for them who made us all. Up with the kettle and down with the pan. Give us good alms and we'll be gone. Okay, the last line didn't rhyme. It, would, it was Gan, but, you know, <laughs> language changes. Anyway, that's the song. Uh, and so uh, much in the same way as the Romans, as expressed by Virgil and his Aeneid, medieval Christians believe that the deceased remained in limbo in a holy place uh, after death. This is still the belief today of the Catholic Church. Now, the house-to-house -house tradition uh, may derive from the ninth century and was called solely. S O U L I N G. And of course, it originated from this where Ireland and then Britain. By the 16th century, there is evidence of souling, this to tradition of these processions going about from place to place, um, spread all the way to Italy. Uh, even Shakespeare mentions it uh, in The Two Gentlemen of Verona uh, in 1593. Uh, but there is a connection, or is there a connection? Is there a connection between souling, going from place to place with these soul cakes, singing their songs, right, to getting people out of purgatory? Is there a connection between souling and trick or treat? Uh, you know, you know, the idea of begging for soul cakes, and later on, you know, what you're begging for is not soul cakes; it's candy, right? <laughs> is there a connection? Well, some scholars say yes. Some scholars say no, but, uh, and so the jury's out on this one, but there is lots of traditions that are similar, but we can go in there that seem to connect the dots between the two, but there you have it, right? Um, by the time the English and Irish came to the Americas, the practice uh, of sowing had died down to popularity, and it was, it was more popular to go to church in preparation for All Saints Day and All Souls Day after that. Now, that's, uh, you know, you got to thank the Puritans or don't thank the Puritans for that. Apparently, however, Halloween night was also the time for pranksters. What? Yeah, pranksters. Knocking on doors, very haphazard responses resulted. So this, during the 19th century, actually, even as uh, even as early uh, as the 18th century, uh, you have this tradition of this period of time, November 1st, is a time for tricky people. Sounds like trick or treat is about to come down, huh? Trick, uh, where does it start? Of course, it starts in Scotland. Where else, right? Scottish Highland. I know you're thinking Ireland, but we're doing tricks now. <laughs> if you're Scottish, you're going, yay, thank you. Uh, so the Scottish Highlands goes back to at least 1736. And then Ireland also. And the idea is, is this was called Mischief Night. Uh, so this custom then crossed over the Atlantic. And so throughout the 19th century, various newspapers talked about all these juveniles doing all these tricks on this day. Uh, but when does the trick and the treat come together? 
Well, we have, uh, again, now this is Scotland again. Uh, we may have to thank the Scottish again for this part. For apparently there's a tradition known as guising, which was already in full swing by 1895, which seemed to be, this is where I'm talking about connections. It seemed to be this guising is a leftover tradition of solely. Got it? But, uh, and here, people who are now masqueraded are going house to house. And you know what they're asking for? Not soul cakes. They're asking for fruit and cakes. So uh, am, I, am, I, am I a mute? Somebody just says I'm a mute. Can you guys hear me? Make sure you guys are able to I hear, hear me. You. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so one person said I was a mute. So, okay. So what happens is this. I don't, uh, this is the drum roll, please, right? Uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, so as, as opposed to uh, asking for soul cakes, uh, they're going around masqueraded. Uh, we're asking for fruit and cakes. I kind of like that. Can we go, can we do that again? I think that would be great. Can you imagine? <laughs> you know, giving us fruit and cakes. Because oh, I like cake. I like pie, too. Give me pie. Just not in the face. Okay, so what happens now is that it looks like it's the Scottish again who are giving us the special gift. Um, uh, they even carried lanterns, in some cases, uh, made out of scooped out turnips. So it looks like there's a treat here. And you see the treat? I, I consider a cake a treat, a fruit a treat. So, but what is it called, trick or treat? Well, this. Uh, well, the idea, the custom of trick or treating, of giving a treat or a trick, it first appears in a newspaper article from 1911. Uh, it's from Kingston, Ontario. So the Scottish, you know, you got the Canadians, right? Well, it was reported that one of the local Halloween customs included children going door to door singing songs in exchange for candy and nuts <sighs> and maybe people got tired of making a big old cake and handing it out and thinking you know maybe any smaller <laughs> maybe that's the switch of or just the marketing of candy is happening during this time uh but uh, what happens now uh is that yeah thank you canadians go canada uh now it looks like they're but it, i was reported that's one of the traditions so that means it probably goes further back it just reporting now what is it called? Uh, trick or treat? Well, uh, you still have this trick and treat con concept happening uh, in Chicago, but they're still called trick or treat. Just like, hey, you know, uh, but spreading through the Americas. But the word trick or treat being used at a regular basis, it appears first in 1927 uh, from Alberta, Canada. Uh, and there you have it. So there we have trick or treating. Now, let's do a little bit more, if you don't mind. Um, I know this is it's pretty interesting. I want to just go to a few other areas. I know you're dying, and I know that during the question and answer time, you're going to be asking me all these questions. So let's keep on going and maybe answer as many questions as I can ahead of time. Okay, so um, unless you have any questions right now, but I think we'll hold off. Um, so now what will happen is, is because Samhain was a time when the dearly departed were remembered, the ancient Celts used to put an image of a skeleton in front of their homes, um, you know, to, to remember the dead. For the Celts, the head was the most uh, spiritually powerful part of the body. Uh, for the Celts, they believed that the spirit was in the head, not the heart. Uh, the spirit was where the faculties of knowledge happened to be. Uh, this, by the way, uh, is echoed throughout the world. Uh, it's, it's actually demonstrated that uh, during the, we see even through archaeology during the Paleolithic and Neolithic age, is that it seems like the head is esteemed as being where the spirit or the soul is, hence the reason why they'll have this practice of cutting off the head and burial, because they don't want the reanimation going on there. So uh, what will happen is, is that um, along and the short of it, is that there's going to be um, <laughs> well, I'll just go here. Uh, so not necessarily implying that the 
else were, you know, ahead of their time. That's a bad joke, sorry. But they held to the view of the special sacredness of the head and felt that it represents uh, a power to scare evil spirits away lurking about in the middle of the night. And so there's lots of British and Welsh and Irish stories that mention the brazen head. Some scholars uh, believe that uh, this is connected to a practice of head hunting, whereby heads were nailed uh, to the lintel of the door and brought into the house to speak their wisdom. And of course, the idea is, uh, you know, uh, that the human bodies, especially the heads incorporated into houses, uh, will give it some sort of power. We see this in ancient Jericho. We see this in Katahuyak. Uh, they will put the bones of the ancestors literally in the walls and under the floor. So there is something there. But of course, the topic of human sacrifice does rear its ugly head. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> anyway, stop. Uh, so you do have that. And I mean, but the idea of human sacrifice is common. I mean, well, even the Greeks, the Mycenaean Greeks during the the, 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 you know, the, the, you know, before the Dark Age, you have these references there, you know, remember uh, Agamemnon kills Epigena, right, you know, the sacrifice to the dark goddess, and so this is just part of uh, ancient stories, doesn't mean they, they kept doing it. Eventually, rather than an actual human head, the ancient Celts substituted the head of, uh, uh, basically with a turnip or the root of egg to frighten off harmful spirits, carving them into lanterns. And this action was most likely uh, reserved for special occasions, but of course, obviously for sour. Now, of course, these heads were not only used for wisdom, right, but for protection. And then we get into the jack-o'-lantern. As for the name jack-o'-lantern, this designation goes back to the Irish. It looks like the Irish and the Scottish are competing here. Do you see that when it comes to the, uh, the, some of these stories? Uh, this, is, this is the story of Stingy Jack. You guys have heard of Stingy Jack? Uh, he liked to gamble. He liked to drink. He enjoyed playing tricks on people. And one day, he decided to play the ultimate trick on oh, the devil himself. And so what he does he chases the devil up a tree, and then below the tree, he puts the crucifix. And of course, the devil, he can't get down the tree because, ooh, the crucifix is there. So uh, what happens is Stingy Jack makes a deal. He says, okay, I will remove the crucifix if you promise not to harass me uh, and tempt me when I'm doing whatever I want to do. <laughs> the devil agrees. He makes a bargain with the devil. He says, okay, I'm not going to give you any any penalties or anything else, I'll just leave you alone. Stingy Jack says, oh, that's great. So he gets away with everything. And so he dies. And he goes up to heaven. And he's not allowed in heaven because God is mad at him because he made a deal with the devil. He goes to hell. The devil's mad at him <laughs> because, hey, you know what? <laughs> you, I'm mad at you. I don't want you my, even out of hell. So what happens is Stingy Jack gets stuck because, uh, you know, he lived a disreputable life. He gets stuck in the realm in between. He's between heaven and hell in this in-between place, in this limbo, uh, in this purgatorial uh, state of endless night, right? <laughs> and so with nothing but a candle inside of a hollow turnip to illuminate the way, uh, so says the story. And so there you have it. Uh, it's a jack-o'-lantern. So to protect, uh, for perhaps to connect this uh, imagery to the wandering jack uh, turnip, known as the mango wurzels, <laughs> were hollowed out and made into lanterns on, yes, Salwin. Uh, they're also known as punkies. I think we should call them punkies. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, and they were lit up during this during the special ceremony, uh, which included dancing, singing, and the lighting of bonfires. Of course, uh, this goes back. But when the custom of carving jack lanterns reached the North America, they thought, you know what? Maybe not a turnip. Let's go for a pumpkin. So that became the preferred vegetable. So uh, there, there you have uh, that particular story. Uh, also, during this period of time, uh, during the 19th century, now 18th, 19th century, I, I mentioned, of course, the bobby for apples, 
were becoming popularized uh, amongst, you know, it starts the Enlightenment, the looks of Victorian subsect. We talked about that wonderful, uh, you know, I have Casey nutshells into the fire. Uh, another tradition happened during this period of time. Uh, people wrote messages on pieces of paper in milk. And then the notes were then folded and placed into walnut shells. And then they threw the walnut shells into the fire, causing the milk to brown just enough on the, on the uh, walnut shell to read the mysterious message that you had planned. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, it would go away. Another one, because you know you're going to ask me this question too, and that is mirror gazing. Because remember, this is the realm of the world are in. It's like looking into a mirror. Mirror gazing for divination becomes popular. Uh, and of course, this goes back uh, quite a ways. Uh, but the idea is the hope to, to catch a glimpse of themselves. Uh, or, you know, you're having some story. One, one interesting story next to this one uh, is that young women, and they used to, I'm sorry, this is too much fun. Well, young women used to walk backwards up the staircase and they would be holding a candle and a hand mirror at the same time. I'm thinking, you know, this is a recipe for disaster. So you can picture this Victorian lady wearing this long gown, walking upstairs backwards with her hands full, a mirror. <laughs> no, I don't answer. Okay. And the idea was, is that um, she walks backwards. And what will happen is, is that... Um, uh, the, they will see uh, whether or not uh, they're the face of their future husband. So supposedly in the mirror, they're going to see the face of the future husband, but if they see a skeleton looking back in the mirror, that means that they're not going to get married, they're going to die. Well, if you're, I don't know, if you're walking upstairs backwards, you know, holding uh, a lamp a lamp and a, and a, and a, and a mirror, uh, I think you're, you're asking for it, but I'm just saying. So this will start to combine with other stories of divination with the mirror, uh, and it will connect to a gradually evolve into what's called the Bloody Mary. You guys have heard this, right? You know, the appearance of the corpse witch, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's friendly, sometimes it's evil and covered in blood. Uh, it may curse you. Uh, it may steal your soul, it may scratch your eyes out, right? And so uh, where does this legend begin? Well, well, uh, it, a lot of scholars are fighting about this. Folklores are fighting about this. They agree, no. Quite a few will say it connects to Mary I of England, who burned 300 Protestants at the stake, and she's known as Bloody Mary. And the idea is Protestants didn't look didn't like her, uh, she was not popular. Obviously, you have Elizabeth taking over after that. And so the idea, the concept is, is that <laughs> we're going to, uh, uh, through folklore, is that, you know, we got to worry that, that she may appear in the mirror. If we're not careful, but we can make her appear. And so this idea, of course, Bloody Mary uh, starts to form. Um, they have been, folklorists have been studying this since the 1970s, wondering where in the world this legend comes from. Uh, a lot will, will say it's from Protestant myth. Others will say, no, it's not. Others will say it's a combination of Victorian mirror stories. I just gave you that. I do want to say something interesting, is that people all over the world have these stories. I always think of the Hanukkah song. You guys ever the Hanukkah song uh, stories? Oh, this is the Japanese legends. This goes all the way back to like the 1400s. In fact, one folklore is traces it back to 1470. Uh, and it's, it, there's a similarity here. Here, this Japanese legend is a young girl. Supposedly, it's a young girl uh, who who haunts uh, a the school toilets. <laughs> now, supposedly, uh, she's from World War II era. Now, I got to tell you, it goes back to the 1400s, which means there's earlier incarnations of the spirit. But the most recent 20th 20th century version is as a World War II uh, girl that had bobbed hair or in a red dress, and she's playing hide-and-go-seek uh, during the time when the bombs hit, and then, of course, uh, she dies during this. But the earlier stories have it where she is. Uh, no, she wasn't uh, that. She was murdered by her parents. 
And the earlier version of that story says, no, 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 he committed suicide. So, and again, folklore traces back to the 1400s. But the more modern story goes as follows, is that uh, basically uh, you go to the third story of your, of your school, which of course, you know, if your school has a third story, you go to the, you go to the bathroom on the third story, you go to the third stall, and you knock three times, <laughs> uh, and you say, are you present? And it says, yes, I am. Uh, then, of course, a ghost will appear, uh, and you take the risk. In some cases, the toilet becomes the opening to the underworld, <laughs> or a three-headed lizard will come and attack you. I don't know if you really should do this. Don't try this at home. It's a bad idea. But uh, this is a period of time where the veil is thin, and so you're going to have these kinds of stories that just jump up. Okay, so, yeah, and, and this, this will lead, I won't go into it unless you want to know more about it. Uh, these stories about, uh, this will go into stories like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow when it comes to heads, uh, which is, of course, obviously Brothers Grimm and Ichabod Crane. I can talk about that. I can talk about The Dark Man. I can talk about the Wild Hunt legends that also now connect to this period of time. Which, uh, which you know, um, and then of course, I can go into other bits and pieces, but I want to make sure that I talk about one more holiday next to it, and that is the Day of the Dead. I want to make sure I do this, and then we can go back if we want to learn other things. But uh, the Day of the Dead, those Dias de los Muertos, right, it was originally a pre Columbian celebration. And it was practiced by many indigenous peoples in Mesoamerica, South America, including the Mexica, right? Uh, the Aztecs, right? The Day of the Dead was not originally celebrated on October 31st or November 1st or November 2nd. No, no. The Day of the Dead, this is, you may know this, may not this, it originally spanned the entire, from, from the end of July to mid-August, which is the ninth month of the Aztec calendar, and was celebrated all month long. So the Day of the Dead wasn't the Day of the Dead. It was the month of the dead. Although, having said that, the Mayan calendar, sorry, Mayan, the Aztec calendar only has 20 days. Well, actually, the Mayan calendar also has only 20 days, and the Toltecs, so it's all 20 days, so shorter months. So it's the month of the dead. The festival was dedicated to the goddess uh, Mik uh, Tikasiwato, often known as the Lady of the Dead. According to one version of the story, uh, Mik Tikasiwato was once a human child that was sacrificed as an infant. Of course, infant sacrifice was common amongst uh, the Aztecs and others. Uh, in fact, most of the central holy days of Kalak who was the fierce god of rain, uh, involved the sacrifice of children of some kind. Uh, so this just simply happens, right? Uh, on his holiday, which is, or a special time, uh, which is on February 12th, uh, children were sacrificed at the top of mountains throughout the Aztec realms. Uh, in fact, the horrible thing is, is that the child, they'd be told they're being sacrificed, and the more they cry, the more that was considered good luck because that would be sympathetic magic to make it rain more. I know. The, anyway, so moving right along. And then, of course, when they sacrificed uh, them on the top of the hilltops, the removal of the heart and so forth. And, okay, moving right along. So, Nick Tika Siwato was depicted as a skeleton with her jaw open wide so she could swallow the stars during the daylight hours. Uh, Mink Tikasiwato was traditionally the goddess that watched over bones. Uh, and so uh, it was more than simply looking over the bones uh, to, to make sure there's no desecration. You see, accordingly, uh, the belief is, is that all people are made of the bones of those of the past. So the bones of those of the past would be recycled to be used in the various uh, different worlds, the first world, second world, third world, fourth world. And so the bones needed to be guarded so they could be part of the next uh, creation. 
Uh, now, so what happens is Miko Tika Siwano, uh, her sacred animal attendant was, well, bird attendant was the owl uh, and was known to live in this really dark region. Uh, the Mexica, the Aztecs gave uh, various, uh, lots of blood uh, to her, blood offerings. In some cases, what they will do is they, they will take, they'll have its rope. And this is earlier on too, other groups did this too. And they had a, uh, of horns, not horns, thorns, yeah, maybe horns, thorns on this rope. And what they would do is they stick uh, this rope with the thorns, they stick it through their lower lip, and they go like this, you know, like that. And they do that, it, it would go into a blood bowl. And then they would offer this blood bowl, this life force, uh, to this, this goddess. I don't want to do that, but you know, I'm just saying. Uh, her consort was Miklan Tiktutl. Uh, and uh, this is the Lord of Death, uh, who is also honored with these offerings. Um, in fact, um, the idea, anyway, so the ideal here uh, is that Meek Tika Siwato uh, continued to be part of the popular imagination. And then there came along, I want to tell you the story because I think it's interesting. I really find it fascinating. Uh, there is this Mexican artist. Uh, his name is Jose Guadalupe Posada. He lived from 1852 to 1913. Uh, he was hired as a political cartoonist. Uh, and, um, you know, and he made cartoons in this work called The Bumblebee. Uh, he loved drawing these scary drawings. Uh, he did ruin the paper. People were too scared of his cartoons. And after 13 issues, uh, the paper closed down. But uh, what he did is he, he made these scary images of, of death and other kinds of themes, combining Catholic and earlier Aztec as well as, as, uh, uh, as, as Toltec and, and Mayan influences. Uh, so there is. And so what he did, uh, he, liked, he became most famous for drawing skeletons. He liked drawing skeletons. But eventually, of course, so, so even though the newspaper folded, uh, people bought his skeleton art, and they seemed to like it, but then they got tired of it. And then, uh, unfortunately, he died in poverty in 1913. It's too bad. Uh, but before he died, right before he died, sometime between 1910 and 1913, Posada made a famous image of a skeleton woman wearing an elaborate European hat complete with flowers and plumes. I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, this kind of hat was all the rage before World War I. Well, uh, he, was, he was using this uh, as a commentary on how, how those in Mexico were following too much of the European fashions. You know? but, uh, but what happened is, is that many will then connect this image to uh, Mika Tika C. Waddle herself. And so she becomes, in, in popular culture, represented by uh, po uh, Postana's image of a skeleton. She becomes, and then she then in turn connects to another a saint called Saint Muerta. So now this combines with Saint Muerta. That's so interesting. Sorry. So you have this one image, right? Right, you know, Posada's image, right? This Posada's image is now kind of coming together with this other idea. Uh, well, who is Santa Muerta? Well, the, the story goes back to the end of the Spanish Inquisition uh, in Mexico, the 18th century. Uh, there's one story that, that the, the inquisitors, for some reason, they tied up the skeleton uh, and, um, and whipped the skeleton in order to get their wishes granted. It's a kind of a strange kind of custom. You know, almost seems semi-magical and weird. You get your wishes by being a skeleton uh, but, uh, or threatening it with the whip, right? She didn't, uh, she didn't comply, uh, you know, but uh, so that she was completely beaten though she could set it. Uh, so what happened is, is that she became known as Saint Death. Okay, so now what happens is her memory kind of went underground for a period of time and reappeared in the, in the night during World War II, during the 1940s uh, in Mexico City. And one uh, Mia Tiatina, 
venerated her in the 1950s. And so what happens now is this Saint Muerta, this, 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 this uh, will become, as opposed to this skeleton that is tied to, uh, tied down and beaten by, uh, uh, by the inquisitors and, and finally will give whatever wish you want, which is just horrible. Instead, this idea is reforged and she becomes the protector of souls, both uh, children and adults. And then this concept will combine with Mika Tika Siwato. And so, in fact, uh, she's even depicted with the owl. See all these ideas just all kind of come together. Uh, and so today, uh, uh, Lady Death is positioned uh, for everything, you know, business, justice, protection from danger, attracting lovers, votive candles are offered to you. If you go to Day of the Dead celebrations, you're going to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, Santa Muerto uh, being, being shown there. But I want you to understand that she does combine uh, with Mika Tika Siwato in aspect two. So she is a saint for some, a goddess uh, for others, and she's reforged from being a, uh, a, a tormented skeleton to something that is a protectress, which is which is a beautiful thing. I like that. It's good. Well, the Catholic Church doesn't like it too well. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, they, pro they they proclaim that this uh, she's not a saint. Uh, she's a degeneration of religion, and saying that she's of the devil. Well, because that's the, that's the, that's the, anyway that's the official. When the Spanish now, when the Spanish conquered Mexico, they attempted to end the month long festival of Mi Tica Siwato. But this tradition was simply ingrained in the traditions of the people. And so guess what happens? You know, this this month long or 20 day long celebration gets moved. I know, a surprise, and guess where it goes? It, it goes to uh, November 1st and November 2nd and coincides with All Saints Day and All Souls Day, November 1st and 2nd. You know, just like uh, the Roman holiday is not moved, right? Uh, so now the indigenous holiday of the Mexica and those of Mexico get moved uh, to All Saints Day and they all combine together. Okay, so there you have it. But you know, uh, you can see uh, how the remember the Roman idea of having dinners beside the graveside, which they celebrated, which was still popular throughout Latin America. Uh, sorry, 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 throughout Latin, uh, European uh, Latin areas of Europe. Excuse me. So, so in other words, this idea of eating by the, the graveside of, of the beloved uh, for their special days, which had moved. Uh, to the time of, of All Saints Day, All Souls Day, uh, throughout places like Italy and Spain and Portugal and South of France. Well, this combines with the same kind of idea that's occurring uh, amongst the Mexica. Isn't this fascinating? Okay, so while November 1st is All Saints Day for Catholics, it is also the Day of the Innocents, right? Uh, also known as the Day of the Little Angels for the Indigenous Peoples. While November 2nd is known as All Souls Day for the Catholics, it is a Dea de las Mortas, right? The Day of the Dead for the Indigenous Peoples. See how that works? And so the assimilation now moves together, right? And, you know, there was a way, though, that convinced the Indigenous Peoples to think that maybe this will work, moving it. Uh, from July to August uh, into November, and that is uh, there are there are those who are the basically have the migrating monarch butterflies. Uh, they return to to Mexico during this period of time, and the butterflies in the imagination of those of, of Mesoamerica are connected with souls. Got it. So the idea of the returning monarchs butterflies could be understood as a return of the souls in the symbolic sense. They're going, all right, we'll go with it. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, meanwhile, uh, Spanish associated with uh, the Aztec uh, deity, the black uh, Tessicopoca, uh, with the devil. 
while Mika Tika Siwata was death or lady of the dead. Uh, so for the Mexica, the devil and death were often interpreted uh, as brother and sister. Uh, for the Mexica, uh, this continued, uh, this tradition, these traditions continued into the 19th and 20th centuries, where uh, it was believed, it was actually used to scare people to go into church because the idea is you better be in church on these days because, you know, there's Lady Death looking through the stained glass windows at you. So you better stay in church. Okay. Okay. Now, in preparation for these days, beautiful altars are made at home, lavishly decorated with flowers, especially marigolds and bright red top homes, right? Offerings include tons of food, right? Stacks of tortillas, I'm getting hungry, uh, fruits of all kinds, peanuts and other, other kinds of uh, plates. Day of the Dead breads, of course. Uh, drinks are also generally placed on the altars, including hot cocoa and soda and water. The arriving spirits, they need to be fed, just like the arriving spirits on the days of the dead of the Romans had to be fed. Remember that? Well, guess what? Same tradition is here amongst the Mexica. Uh, and obviously, uh, you're supposed to give, you know, to the, 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 aunt, the, the relative or ancestor, the relative, uh, foods that they liked, uh, just like the Romans uh, for their deceased had to give them the foods that they liked. And so there you have it. So on the Day of the Innocents, some visit the graves of infants and bring toys along with other decorations. But in some cases, uh, the family kind of waits to visit them the next day. However, the night before, sometimes children make an altar dedicated to the spirit of, of the children. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's interesting. On uh, the, the day of the dead, I always the people visit the graves of their loved ones. And, and they, they go out and clean the graves, cutting the, the grass if need be. Have I been to one of these celebrations? Of course I have. <laughs> so. Um, so I was uh, married for many years, uh, uh, with, with, uh, the Hispanic uh, background. So yeah, we did this. Uh, next, uh, the grave is decorated with flowers, and candles, and foods, and drinks. You know, photos are placed here too with the deceased, right? There's an all-night vigil that follows. You tell family stories about the deceased one. You, you try to be cheerful. Uh, even tell fun stories. It's a time, I love this. It's a time for remembering those you, you love, uh, you know, I, I've spoken up here. Sorry. Perish those that you, that you love. It's on a special, special day. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's a great idea. Okay, so we're almost done. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, one more last thing. Uh, of course, you have the tradition of making sugar skulls, right? Uh, the sugar industry was really big in Europe. It arrived uh, amongst the Italians in the 1600s. Uh, and um, by the way, this art of making sugar skulls started in Palermo, Italy. Uh, and so it was used for making angels and uh, lambs to decorate churches. It's a nice cheap way of making these things. But you can guess sooner or later, uh, they're thinking, you know what? Actually, really soon, sugar skulls appear. Uh, and uh, these become very popular. Uh, and, and, and of course, each skull was under, understood as representing a soul, and they would write the name of the deceased directly in the forehead. And so these sugar skulls were either placed on the altar intended for the Day of the Dead or placed on the gravestone. Either way, this activity was intended to honor the soul of the deceased. And you know, the, the sugar skulls, they're all smiling. And so it's this idea of, of happiness, of, of celebration. And so there you have it. I didn't give you all the answers, but I gave you a lot of different possibilities, myriads of ideas, but just understand that Halloween is really a mixture of all these different uh, belief systems converging together as one. As a real quick final recap, you've got obviously the Samhain tradition, the Catholic tradition. You have it over here. You have over here, you have the Roman tradition, the Roman the Pomona and the Lemuria and all that, which is all kind of spread out uh, over the calendar. And then what happens is Christianity arises 
And, and what it does is it slowly converts uh, Samhain into a day dedicated to the, to the saints. Meanwhile, they're doing their work on the other side, uh, making Lemuria its own little own separate day of the, of the saints of Mary. And then what they do is they take these and they combine together as one. Okay, there you got that bush. <laughs> and then what happens uh, is that now you have this combination of these ideas coming together. You got a little bit of, 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 of you know, Celtic beliefs, lots of, lots of Celtic beliefs and ideas. You've got Roman beliefs and ideas. And when they converge, they really amplify those ideas. Like, for example, the apple concept, right? And then with a the Christian overglaze. And then Christianization uh, continues, comes over the new world. And these, in, these earlier ideas seem to pop out uh, during the Victorian era and into the early 20th century, uh, you know, these, these earlier uh, traditions and ideas that work are encountering a new modern world. And then at the same time, uh, you have this other stratum, which of course uh, is, the, uh, is the Mexica, uh, the, um, uh, the ideas of the Mesoamerica, of, of the Mayans into the Toltecs and Aztecs, and their month of the dead, which becomes the day of the dead, and that becomes transferred over as well. So you're looking at uh, what is Halloween? Is it Celtic? Yes. Is it Roman? Yes. Is it Christian? Yes. Um, is it Mesoamerican? Yes. And all these competing claims really do blend together uh, into this cornucopia and this wonderful holiday that we'll be celebrating uh, later on this month. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs> I gave you a lot of material. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. And I drank all my water. <laughs> Um, why October 31st? Uh, why is every other date is there's no the, uh, the day of the uh, day of the souls and everything uh, November 1st November 2nd why was the transition to October 31st for our team was it convenience or just who knows why it's a misunderstanding uh, yeah, really? yeah it's, a, it's a misunderstanding is is that the day begins November 1st begins ah. on the evening mm -hmm. at sundown ah so it's a different understanding of days. So for us, we see the new day starting at midnight. But, mm. but for the ancients, especially the Celts, their day, uh, uh, the new day starts at sundown. Also, you mm. see this in Jewish thought too. Sundown, huh. like Passover, right? So oh, I see. Hmm. interesting. Is this, is this fascinating? Yeah, so it is. So, it is. <laughs> so really, we should be celebrating, um, uh, you know, um, not November 1st, but if we want to be traditional, you can kind of hold the kids back until the sun sets. And then, then theoretically, it really is Halloween. Because Halloween, of course, means Halloween evening. Yeah, so. Let's just hold them back anyway to November 1st. Hold just them back all, all together, right? Right? Yeah, exactly. just hold them back. <laughs> yeah, great question, by the way. Thank you so much. Margie well, says, I... I it's a thought about handing out candy instead of cakes and fruit. The availability of processed sugar would have had a big influence on the choice of treat. Yeah, you know, I hate to say that uh, much like Valentine's Day and other holidays, uh, it looks like there's some commercial marketing being involved uh, uh, as we get into the into the 20s and 30s with candy. It's like, hey, not a cake, not fruit. No. Andy, you know, because mm -hmm. I remember because my grandpa, uh, you know, you know, you know, they they most days my grandpa it's it's, 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 it's apples, it's, it's fruit still. Fruits are still the kind of that's what you give. So if you ask ask your great grandparents or grandparents, it still is fruits and nuts, for you know, never a banana, <laughs> a squish, <laughs> idea. And it's like ooh, candy. So it becomes an opportunity for. Um, a commercialization to really step in, which is too bad. Mm -hmm. Roger T. <laughs> yes, any other questions? Plus, it was Moaning Myrtle, the ghost in the, the bathroom in Harry Potter. Yes. I, that, wasn't everybody thinking Moaning Myrtle? I think I was thinking Moaning Myrtle. That? Yeah, Moaning Myrtle. 
yeah, I mean, you, you got to think, you know, it's so interesting because you have so many stories and legends about seeing things in the mirror mm -hmm. uh, and using that for divination. I mean, it goes back, even I mean, there's, there's even uh, Greek uh, mythological ideas connected to looking at the reflection in the water in the mirror. So, I mean, you know, in divining by the mirror, I mean, you have even the Oracle of, of uh, Minima, you know, you know, it, it, the Oracle was seen through the waters. But, yeah, so, yeah, so it, it, you can see where these ideas kind of combine together, even with the Bloody Mary uh, story. And these are stories that are, are part of popular culture. And we don't have anthropologists writing all these down at the time. And so the thing is, when these stories start to appear, we think to ourselves, is this where they're starting? Or has it been going on for a long time beforehand? And they're just now writing, writing it down. Yeah. And, um, and I do believe that there is a connection between souling uh, and then, of course, into the, the trick-or-treat idea. You can see that. And the connecting cord is, of course, the Scottish, right? I, I, I see this kind of this kind of, kind of tug of war between the Irish and Scottish. Like, hey, you know, and the English are all, hey, we're here somewhere. It's like, yeah, but seems like a lot of the stories are coming from that area when it comes to Samhain and some of these other innovations. So, I had no idea. That was yeah. all new knowledge. So, any other questions? Um, are there, what countries celebrate Halloween the way we do, besides the UK, I suppose? Oh, well, mm. it's, it's celebrated all, all over the place now. Um, you know, Western culture is, is, is very well entrenched. So it's, I mean, it's celebrated throughout Europe uh, and, and, of course, the Americas, you know, in uh, and, and degrees, intensities, you know. So there are certain countries where it's not as much. It just depends on wherever the touch of, of European as well as American influence happened to be. So that's a good question. Yeah. yeah I was in Italy for Halloween uh, a couple of years back. And they did have a small amount of Halloweenish stuff in uh, in the shops, but it was kind of a uh, a new and interesting thing that they were just trying out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's fun, you know. It's it, it, it takes a while, but it'll be there. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Julian. Uh, you say wonderful. Uh, you, you turn this, oh, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And turn an ordinary night into something so cool and spooky. I'm working early tomorrow, so I unfortunately have to log out. But thank you so much for being here, Julian. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Great having you here. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I, I guess we have a statement on a question. Terry says, uh, you can join me for my talk on the ancient Manichaeans uh, on November 17th. So that's that will be really interesting. So from my perspective. All right. Looking forward to that one. All right. And there's, of course, there's a talk before, but I lost it on the... I don't even know what I'm talking before this. Uh, what am I talking <laughs> about before this? Um, uh, oh, Laurel says I was very thorough. Okay, so I did ask... I knew at a certain point when I got to, to 9.30... I'm not, you know, you'll have so many more questions. I thought, okay, I better keep going and anticipate all the questions. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, so thank you, Laurel. Okay, so I'm doing my magic in the early medieval church. Yes. On no, yeah, on, on November 3rd. And then on November 17th, I'm doing a talk on Manichaeism. So, so there you have it. Message from Starfleet Command, top priority. What was that? That, that? That's my text alert. Sorry. Oh, wow. I, I, I was ready to go to service. You know, let's, yeah. ready, let's go. Yeah, this is Lieutenant Uhura. She tells right. me when I have a text. Yeah. Well, if there's, if there's no more questions, you're all happy and you're all satisfied. You know? I'm so happy I got to talk about uh, the stories of Mexico. I was so happy to bring that in there. I was going, oh, no. <laughs> This is so interesting. I want to make sure I do that. Okay. Well, then have a great night. And I will see you in a, in a few weeks from now.